Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Leveraging the Critical Security Controls to Mitigate User and Asset-Based Risk, sponsored by Beyond Trust. My name is Benjamin White with the SANS Institute, and I'll be moderating this webcast. Today's featured speakers are Dr. Eric Cole, SANS Faculty Fellow, and Michael Yaff with Beyond Trust. During the presentation, if you have any questions for Eric or Mike, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. And with that, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Eric Cole. Thank you, Ben. And it is rock and roll time. In 2013, the number one question I would get asked when I talk to managers, directors, executives, generals, and even the president was a simple question, why? Why are organizations getting broken into? What's interesting, in 2014, the number one question I'm now getting when I talk to those same individuals is not why, but how. How do we defend, protect, and secure our information? Because everyone is recognizing the fact that organizations are going to get broken into. The question is, how do we minimize, control, and protect our critical information? So let's take a look at what's going on, how adversaries break into systems, and then what we can do to defend against it. And then once I lay out the framework of what actionable steps are needed to protect and secure your enterprise, we're going to have my good friend and colleague Mike talk about a solution that can be used to implement those defensive controls within your environment. So if we get started, the basis of this slide shouldn't shock anybody. Similar to what happened on Sunday, we are getting our asses kicked. Right? We are not doing a good job at defending and protecting our systems. And we need to go in and understand how the adversary works. Because guess what? They're not going away. If you think that the adversary is going to let up, if you think that the adversary is going to get easier or stop breaking in, you have got it all wrong. They are going to continue to bring the heat. They're going to continue to go hard against us. And we need to properly protect and secure our environment. And the interesting thing is, most organizations are ill-prepared to deal with this threat. I always am amazed when these large companies get compromised. And you can pick your favorite one. I'm not going to call out any particular one on this webcast. You can pick any of your favorites. But after it occurs, I always talk to journalists and friends and other folks when I get interviewed on this. And they always go in and say, wouldn't a large company sort of had better security? Wouldn't a large company have had better protection and better controls? Like, did, didn't they know that this was going to happen? And unfortunately, in many cases, the answer is they don't. That They're not focusing in on the right areas. Now, let's be clear here. There's a difference between money and resources and doing the right things that are needed to protect the enterprise. Yes, I would argue most large organizations are spending money and resources on security. However, they're not spending it in the right areas. Well, let me put it another way. They're not defending the correct weaknesses that are needed to protect their organization. They don't know how the adversary works. They're not letting the offense inform and guide the defense. We need to go in and we need to understand the anatomy of an attack. Because if we understand how an attacker works, we can properly defend and protect against it. So what are the core characteristics of how attackers operate today. Now this slide is sort of a good news, bad news slide. The bad news is most advanced attacks today 
are customized one-off attack vectors. They are unique and different for every entity they go after, which means much of our standardized signature-based components that we've deployed from a security perspective are not necessarily going to work in this environment. The good news, though, is while the specific signatures are unique and different, the steps they're taking and the way they're breaking in are the same. Most of the attacks we're seeing today are targeting an individual, typically a device or a system that the organization didn't necessarily know was on the environment. They're delivering them a payload, typically via email or web or social media or other protocols. When they go in and are inadvertently tricked into clicking on that attachment or link, a file gets uploaded to their system, a new process runs that survives a reboot, and then they make an outbound C2 known as a command and control connection back out to the adversary, beaconing out so they can get access to that device, and then that device starts doing internal recon and pivoting deeper and deeper into the network. So if we sort of step back to lay the premise of where we're going with the core characteristics, what we're really talking about is organizations don't necessarily know what's on their environment, what's on the network, what's in their environment. They're not controlling the devices. They don't understand the exposures or the weaknesses. And they're not controlling or minimizing access within the environment. I'll tell you, if you take a look at those first bullets, how are they delivering that evilness into the network? Or I'll put it another way, what are the two most dangerous applications on planet Earth? Now, I was teaching this a few months ago for a classroom of about 200 students, and I asked them the question. I said, what are the two most dangerous applications on planet Earth? And one of the students yelled out, Angry Birds. Hmm. And I sort of thought, they're probably right. That wasn't the answer I was looking for, but they're probably not wrong. So let me try it again. Besides Angry Birds, what are the two most dangerous applications out there? I would argue email clients and web browsers. They are the source of most evil. Those are the entry points for damage. So a couple of questions. First, why are you allowing your users to surf the web and check email as admin? That is crazy. There is no need for it, and that is just way too dangerous. So we need to be able to identify those dangerous situations and start removing them next. What if those browsers and email clients ran in separate, isolated virtual machines? Now it's transparent to the user. Whenever they open up their email client or their web browser, everything's running normally except, little do they know, it's running in an isolated, controlled environment. So now, if they click, 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 what's getting infected? The guest, not the host. When they go in and they shut down the browser of the email client, what also goes away? The virtual machine and what goes with it? All the evilness. So now we're going in and we're containing and controlling the damage that a system can do if they do get infected. Finally, what is the entry point for most of this evilness, executable attachments and emails, macros and office documents, and embedded HTML. Most organizations do not need that activity from any system on the internet. So if most organizations do not need that access, why are we allowing it? Why are we going in and not just blocking 
executable attachments, macros and office documents, and HTML embedded content on the systems. So hopefully, I've started to show you that if you're understanding the core characteristics of an attack, there are actionable things that you can do to start minimizing, controlling, and protecting against those vectors. Great, Eric. You just rattled off three to four things. How do we track, prioritize, and focus on that? How can we get an actionable list of the controls that are needed to protect the environment? Well, that's the whole purpose of the critical controls. The critical controls are not meant to replace any of the NIST standards. Those are awesome. Those are great. Those are completely comprehensive ways to roll out security in the environment. They're not meant to replace any of the security frameworks that are out there. They are meant to focus in on the right things that are needed to protect your environment today. They're a starting point. They're a focus area. When we went in and we put together the critical controls, there were several driving parameters that we used. First, data drives decisions. I am one of the authors and editors of the controls. And we debate constantly. And we get feedback from lots of people. This should be a control, and this should be a control, and this should be a control. And my response always back is, show me the data. Show me the data that proves that this is how the offense is breaking into organizations, and these defensive solutions will actually protect and secure the enterprise. And it's real simple. If you can give us the data, we'll put it in. But the idea of the controls is not somebody's personal opinion of what they do or do not think is important. It is the data driving it, which leads to our second parameter of offense must inform the defense. We have to understand how the offense is breaking in and utilize that to focus in on the right areas of security. Third, all of the controls can be measured. Metrics-based security is needed. Why? What's happening today? We do not have unified playbooks within an organization. In many organizations, even some of these large organizations that have been breached, what's the issue? Security is, sorry, IT is doing one thing. Auditors are checking something different. Executives are saying, can somebody tell me what's going on? And security? Yeah, they're pissing everybody off because they're not providing that leadership. Metric-based security provides that leadership because now with the controls, we can have clearly defined metrics in which security defines the metrics, IT implements the metrics, auditors validate the metrics, and executives can understand the metrics. Fourth driving factor behind the controls is automation. We do not have enough security people to manually perform all the tasks that are needed. And manual tasks will eventually fail. We need to automate our security measures. We need to go in and have automated ways to constantly identify new assets that are on our network, identify configuration changes to those assets, and identify any new vulnerabilities or exposure points within that environment. Automated security works. Manual methods do not. So those are all the drivers behind the controls, focusing in on what are the most important areas that an organization can do to protect and secure its environment. And the solutions are right in front of us. 
when I go into many of our clients after they've had a major, major, major breach, and I assess and come up with a get well plan, how do we go in and minimize and reduce the chances of this occurring again? And I brief out the executive team and the IT and the security folks. The comment I usually get back is, Eric, this is sort of back to the basics. There's nothing really revolutionary on here, and this is just good, standard, common sense practices. And my answer is, yeah, absolutely. To fix and secure against these attacks, we don't need to go in and do anything crazy. It's just verifying, validating, understanding what's in your environment and how to protect against it. The fundamental ways to protect and secure your environment are really revolving around three core themes. The first one is asset inventory. You can't protect what you don't know. If you don't know what's in your environment, you can't secure against it. To me, one of the most damaging, dangerous things an organization can do is BYOD. Bring your own device. Personally, I want to know the person who created that term, and I want five minutes alone in a room with them. Now, preferably, I'd like to bring my baseball bat, but I'll use my hands if I need to. I just five minutes alone with them. The idea that people can bring any device, plug it into your environment, and you don't know, control, or manage it, pretty much you might as well go and give up at that point. You can't protect what you don't know. Ask an inventory. Second, you've got to control and manage the configurations. Configuration management becomes a critical point to understand what is configured and set up in your environment. And then the third core theme is change control. You have to control and manage changes. If people can make or alter components in your environment without you knowing about it, then once again, your security can be defeated very quickly and very fast. So I just always want to warn you because when you go through the critical controls and you start to implement them, the feedback I often get is, well, yeah, these are just good common sense measures. I was talking with one security engineer after I gave a talk on the critical controls, and he comes up to me and says, Eric, I'm a little disappointed. I'm like, why? He's like, I thought you were going to give me things that I could do to protect and secure my environment, and everything you covered is common sense, obvious things that we've been talking about for 10 years. I said, question, are you doing them in your environment? And he looked and said, no. And I said, well, tell you what then. I'm going to keep talking about it until you do. Right? So, and he sort of smiled and said, OK, well played. I never looked at it from that perspective. So don't look at security measures as whether they're obvious or not. Look at them of whether you're doing them, whether you're implementing them, whether you're automating them. Because that's really ultimately what it comes down to. We've got to stop going and looking for this get fast, sorry, this get rich quick scheme that everyone's after. It's just hard work if you want to make a lot of money. There's no magical way to secure your environment. It's just good, hard, common sense principles. But, but Eric, I have IPSs and IDSs and firewalls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I got to be careful with this slide. What I am saying is there is an array of attacks that are out there. Not every security solution works with every attack. There's gaps. Most of the stuff that we're deploying today was developed over 8 to 10 years ago. Firewalls and IDSs and IPSs and antivirus software, they were developed over 10 years ago. Yes, they've evolved but the fundamental principles were built to deal with traditional threats. 
Now, traditional threats are still alive and well. They're still out there, which means antivirus and firewalls and IPSs still are very critical to be used in our environment because those traditional threats are still there, they're still out there, they're still occurring. However, these vectors that were built 10 years ago do not scale very well against advanced threats, advanced attacks, targeted, stealthy, data-focused attacks they typically don't work well against. What we need today are automated solutions that can scan environments, identify assets, verify configurations, and look for changes, alterations, or unusual components that can be called, used as a launch platform for the adversary. So we got to be careful with the slide. On the one hand, I am saying that these traditional technologies will not work against advanced adversaries, but because advanced adversaries are not the only game in town and traditional threats are alive and well, these devices are still needed. I am not saying this technology is dead. I am not saying it's ineffective. I'm just saying it doesn't scale against the advanced threats that we're seeing today. So what we're saying is while there is no silver bullet out there, that's going to solve all our problems and all our solutions, we have to go in and start implementing those solutions that fill that gap. We have to go in and say, OK, where are we today? And where do we need to be in order to protect and secure the environment? So we get a question that says, I suggest aggressive automation to get ahead of the threat. Absolutely. That's where we're going here. Manual methods do not scale. Why? Anything that's relying on a human is eventually going to fail because humans get sick, humans go on vacation, humans win the lotto, and humans tell their bosses to go F themselves. Right? That's just the reality. Right? So we need to go in and put that aggressive automation in place. So very, uh, very well said uh, from one of our participants. And as I go through this presentation, please feel free to just drop the questions right in the chat window, and I'd be happy to answer them as we go along. We'll also have a brief Q&A period at the end. But honestly, if there's a question, I'd rather you ask it as soon as you have it. Why wait 30 minutes later to get your questions answered? So I like presentations being interactive, even though this is a virtual environment. Please interact with me via that chat window, and we'll do our best to answer those questions and give you the information you need. So if we look at where the gap is, just going back real quick, these technologies were built for traditional threats, and they're not working well against advanced threats. So if we want to find out what the gaps are, we need to dissect down what these targeted advanced attacks are doing in order to break in. Well, most of it is one-off, zero-day, targeted attacks, which means your IPS and your AV signatures are not going to work here. They're one-off. I sort of joke that a lot of attacks are like Hallmark. Hallmark has a motto, when you care to send the very best. Right? So with today's advanced attacks, when you care to send the very best attack, you're going to do a one-off customized attack vector. Because they're changing, they're jumping to different areas, they're using relays, a lot of your traditional URL filtering devices are not going to work and scale very well. And because they're targeted, they're not going after 80,000 systems, they're not going after the low-hanging fruit, they're targeted against one specific organization and one specific environment, a lot of your traditional security that's meant to look for these large-scale attacks are just not going to work here. So question, uh, can you please reiterate the areas of automation you believe to be the most important? 
absolutely. And that's exactly where we're heading. So if you can just give me about three more slides, I'm going to drill right in to those specific areas and specific controls that we need to automate to be effective at protecting the environment. So uh, excellent, excellent question. You're just about five minutes ahead of me. So I'll, I'm going to catch up with you real, real quick there. So awesome, awesome question. So based on the fact that there's gaps, based on the targeted malware bypasses those traditional software measures, the question is how do we now detect modern malware? And this is getting to your question. We have to continuously monitor our systems. We have to continually know what assets are on our environment, what software is available, and what configurations are set up on those systems. Why? Read all of these different attacks that are out there when they start determining what occurred. In all cases, it was devices and configurations that organizations did not know about or the environment changed and they were not aware that it changed. So understanding, controlling, and managing what devices are on your network, how they're configured, and how they're changed is the most critical area to focus. Then we have to understand what traffic is flowing over that network, looking for any unusual traffic or anomalies. And then finally, if somebody is going to break into a device and cause harm, they're, need, they're going to need to communicate back out to someone on the Internet via what we call C2s or CNCs or command and control channels. So we need to be able to identify and find those encrypted command channels within the environment. So taking that, setting ourselves up for the critical controls, as I mentioned, the intent of these controls are to proactively detect intrusions, to find out somebody breaking in or trying to break into your environment, reduce the exposure, reduce the damage, and give you metrics so you can show cost-effective return on investments for your security solutions. Now, right now, the critical controls are 20 critical controls. And they're ranked based on the effect of attack mitigation. Now, in a perfect world, I would love for you to implement all 20. And by the way, these 20 are really categories with each one of these 20 having anywhere between four to eight sub-controls. So the individual actions you're going to take are going to be more granular than just the 20. These are the high-level categories. Now, in a perfect world, do all 20. But I know that many of you need to prioritize based on different attack vectors that are out there. So what I'd like to do is, based on what we've covered, there's really two areas we need to focus in on asset risk management and user risk management. If we go in and look at asset risk management, those are really the first four controls. The first one is identifying authorized devices. The second one is authorized software that's installed on those devices. The third one is the configuration of those devices. And the fourth one is to continuously scan and remediate any vulnerabilities that are found within the environment. Now, one, two, and three is what I sort of group under our asset inventory configuration management. One, two, and three are really saying you must know what's on your network, you must know the software that's installed on those devices, and you must understand how they're configured and controlled you have to be able to understand what you're protecting to lock down your organization. Then four is the one that many organizations think they're doing and they're not. One of the terms that I hate when my customers use it is we have a vulnerability scanning program. And I'm just like, Arr! why? Vulnerability scanning doesn't solve anything. 
I don't want you to have a vulnerability scanning program. I want you to have a vulnerability remediation program. Now, yes, you need scanning in order to do remediation, but remediation, sorry, scanning without remediation is pretty much useless. We go in and we see all these organizations go in and do all this scanning and all this scanning and all this analysis. And I go, great. And then I go back and I'm like, great, how many did you remediate? How many did you fix? How many did you actually solve? And they go, oh, well, we didn't get there yet. Well, guess what? I'd rather you do a little scanning and a little remediation than a lot of scanning and no remediation. So the questions I always ask is, how many vulnerabilities have you remediated? And how many vulnerabilities that you remediate did get reopened later as a new vulnerability? So when we talk about four, it's really focused on the first and last word. Continuously. Hey, Eric, I have a question for you relative to that. It's, I'd like to also ask, it, it's not just about remediating the vulnerabilities. You've got to be able to tie it to the asset value, right? Because just remediating vulnerabilities for the sake of doing it half the time is a waste of time. So how do you, what do you see around correlating value, uh, one, identifying the assets, and two, correlating the value of the assets with kind of the force that you should apply against them? Uh, excellent, excellent, excellent. So one of the things we'll cover in a minute is, and Mike just hit the nail on the head, is prioritizing the risks against the criticality of the assets. So one of the things you're going to see I say later is before you do anything in the name of security, you always want to answer three questions. What is the risk? Is it the highest priority risk? And is it the most cost-effective way of reducing those risks? So what you want to be doing as you do your vulnerability assessment is you should have a list of your critical assets that are tied to the business processes that support the intellectual property that runs your organization, and then you should have your top eight or ten vulnerabilities, and you should remediate those vulnerabilities against those critical assets that support those key business processes within your environment. So Mike hit the nail right on the head, which says we just don't want to go in and fix random vulnerabilities. We want to fix the right ones which are tied to the critical assets. I often tell my clients I would rather you fix five vulnerabilities in which there's a real threat to your critical assets than fix 500 low-hanging fruit vulnerabilities in which there's no threat and minimal impact. So what you want to constantly do when you find vulnerabilities is look at what is the impact that vulnerability would have based on the likelihood of the threat against the criticality of the asset. And then all of that would tie together to put together your remediation plan. So very, very well said by Mike is you've got to put all those pieces together. In terms of questions, how realistic are these targeted attacks against small and mid-sized businesses? if they're not financial or retail companies. Very, very large, and here's why. One of the things that adversaries are doing today is they're doing supply chain exploitation. They're not directly going after the big company. Why? If you have a billion-dollar organization, how many people and how much money do you think they spend on security? Probably a lot. But if they buy services from another company that sells services, from another company that provides specialized applications, and four levels down in the supply chain management, you have this small company that's making $25 million a year with 1,000 employees how many security people and how much money do you think that small company spends on security? A lot less 
than the larger one. So what we're seeing a lot of adversaries are targeting that much smaller company that indirectly has ties to the larger company and using that as a way to pivot into that larger environment. Supply chain verification is a big problem and issue out there. And it's even worse, why? Going in and saying that a thousand person company with $30 million in revenue got breached or compromised, that's not headline news. That's not front page of the newspaper material. But if that small company gets compromised, and from there they compromise the next company to the next company to the next company, and ultimately a large retail or a large billion dollar organization gets compromised, that's headline news. So the only thing we're seeing in the news is the billion dollar company that got compromised. We don't realize that in many, many cases, it was that supply chain exploitation of a smaller entity that was ultimately targeted. So we've seen a huge increase in those smaller companies being targeted. How do we convince organizations of the need for a CIO and CISO? It is difficult to implement security measures across an organization without a single authoritative voice. First is you must split and have different reporting structure for a CIO and a CSO. They have completely different purposes and focus. If those two are the same individual or one reports to the other, you will have a conflict of interest situation. The CIO, the Chief Information Officer, is responsible for uptime and availability. The Chief Sorry, I got so excited. Believe it or not, believe it or not, when I do webcasts, I'm walking around my office, uh, my arms are waving, and I'm teaching just like I did at a real conference, except I have this clunky microphone, and I got so excited, I knocked the microphone out of my hand, and my phone went flying across the office. So uh, sorry about that delay, but at least you can have that vision uh, of what just happened. So the CIO is responsible for uptime availability and the security officer is responsible for mitigating controlling risks. They are two different and sometimes conflicting roles. So you need to have a CIO and a CSO that have a different reporting structure. How do you convince the organization? Data. Use two data sources. Look at a historical perspective of your organization over the last three years and show what types of attacks and what types of exposure occurred. And second, look at what's happening across your industry and show them how bad and what are the attack vectors that are out there. And use those two data points to start going in and showing the executives that, listen, we really have two options. Option one is we can fix the problem now. Or option two, we can wait to become a statistic, and then we can go in and fix it after the fact. So, so we're going to have to do this over the next two years. Do we want to be proactive or reactive? Now, I'll be honest with you. I've had some of our clients that no matter what you said, they're not going to believe you. They're going to have a breach, and then that's going to drive the creation of a chief security officer. So you're not always going to win in those cases, but by looking at your company's historical risk profile and looking at the risk profile across your industry are two great ways in order to be able to make that case. Uh, the next question is what do I mean by continuous remediation is you are always scanning. So every day, every hour you have automated software that is scanning your environment. It could be distributed and it's looking for new systems, new vulnerabilities, new exposures, and it's tying back to the criticality of the asset and generating reports based on that. So the problem is if you're only doing vulnerability scanning quarterly 
what you're saying is that if somebody creates a vulnerability and an attacker finds it, you're okay to be exposed for three months. I don't think any organization is willing to be exposed for three months. So because the vectors are so damaging, we can't scan once a year or once every three months. We have to have automated tools that are doing that scanning on a regular basis. So now that we have our asset risk management down where we're understanding and controlling those assets, we then have to go in and do user risk management. We have to control what people do as administrators. Never, ever, ever let somebody surf the web or check email as administrator. Then my all-time favorite is you can't protect what you don't know. You have to have detailed logs, and you have to understand and know what's occurring in your environment, and then you have to control and minimize access to your critical data and control what accounts are on the system and disable or remove any unneeded accounts within your organization. So if we look at security that works, there's really five critical tenets of an effective defense system. You have to have asset inventory. You have to know what's in your environment. You have to control and configure those devices. You have to proactively prevent. That's good host hardening. That's going in and reducing the attack surface, removing systems that are not needed, turning off services, closing down ports that are not required. Reactive detection is going in and patching and fixing issues as they become public and people are aware of them. And finally, going in and constantly auditing, verifying, and validating your systems to make sure they're not changing and to make sure they stay in a secure state. And because one of our goals is not just to go in and tell you what you need to do, we want to show you how to actually implement it. When I finish up my slide deck in just a few minutes, we're going to have Mike show you how Beyond Trust can be utilized as a comprehensive suite to achieve these goals. They can go in and achieve those eight critical controls that I laid out on the previous slide in an automated, continuous manner. So as I finish up my section, the five quick wins that can deliver solid risk reduction that we focus on and we give our clients, the first one, and this ties back to some of the questions that we had, is if you look at the right side of the screen, this is one of the biggest game changers that we do with our customers. This is one of the things that our students from our classes that we offer at SANS, they just love. Take a piece of paper, I usually use a slide, and create three columns. In the first column, list what are your critical assets and what are the business processes that support those critical assets. Second column, what are the threats that have the highest likelihood? And third column, what are the vulnerabilities that have the biggest impact? Now, a couple of rules. First, you're only allowed one slide. So you can't have 50 slides. Second, you can only have one slide for your organization. This is going to force focus. And finally, you can't use anything smaller than a 10-point font which means you're going to have five to six items per column. What we're doing now is we're forcing you to do what Mike was saying, which is prioritize your environment. What are the critical assets? What are the threats that have the highest likelihood? And what are the vulnerabilities that have the biggest impact? And as I brought up, based on Mike's question, before you do anything in the name of security, before you spend an hour of your time or a dollar of your budget on anything in security, you want to go in and say, what is the risk? Verify if it's the highest priority risk and determine if it's the most cost-effective way of reducing that risk. 
this is one of the ways to verify you're doing what you should. If you look at your 2014 security roadmap and you cannot answer those three questions for every item on your roadmap, you're not aligned. You're not focused with where you need to be. And I'll let you know a little secret. Every customer that we've worked for that has had a major, major, major incident, headline news moment, and their executive says, Eric, how could this have happened? We've spent $15 million on security. And I said, show me what you've spent. And I went to their security team for every item they spent and asked those three questions. And for more than 70% of their investment, they could not tell me the risk. They could not verify it was the highest priority risk, and they could not confirm it was the most cost-effective way of reducing it. So if you're not aligned with risk-based thinking, you're very, very similar to organizations that are getting compromised. You must align with how the offense operates. This is the basic attacker kill chain. Your recon, scanning, exploitation, creating backdoors, covering tracks. We have a much more detailed one that we've been using for a long, long time, but this is sort of the high-level attacker kill chain that we utilize. Here's the issue. Where do most companies spend their money in defending an environment? Right there. Exploiting and creating backdoors. That's where most defensive energy is spent. What's the problem? That's where the offense spends their time and energy. Well, guess what? If the offense is winning and they're doing a thorough job at recon and scanning and we're not, that's why we're losing. We need to go in and understand what is visible on our network. We have to scan and identify critical assets, ports, and services if we want to protect and secure our organization. In many cases, if I asked you right now, do you know every device on your network? Do you know how it's configured? And do you know where the exposures are? The answer most of you would say is, well, no. Well, here's the problem. For an adversary to break into your environment, how many vulnerabilities do they need to find? Just one. For you to protect your environment, how many vulnerabilities do you need to find? Well, all. Well, guess what? If you don't know what's on your network, if you don't have an accurate up-to-date network diagram. If you don't have a network visibility map to tell me what systems, what ports, and what services are open in your system, then you're going to lose. Because it only takes the adversary one vulnerability. You have to find them all. And if you don't know what's in your environment, you're in a position of weakness. So we need to go in and put ourselves in a position of strength by making it harder for the adversary, by understanding what's in our organization, and then reducing and pruning down the attack surface to make it harder for that adversary to break in. One of the things that I always get so frustrated is when I hear people go in and talk about an unstoppable adversary. There's nothing you can do to stop this adversary. Yes, there is. If you actually focus and understand what's on your environment, we do inbound prevention, outbound detection, we correlate our logs, and we better identify anomalies, that's how we start winning. That's how we start getting one step ahead, and that's directly aligned with those eight critical controls that we highlighted earlier. And then finally, the final step is, you have to have a common set of metrics, which is driven by the critical controls. The critical controls gives us the right things to focus on, driven by the offense, automated ways to measure metrics within our organization. So as we all know, the adversary is not letting up. Traditional defenses are not going to work. We need to go in and take that more holistic approach of understanding our assets configuring, locking down, continuously scanning for vulnerabilities, and limiting what users can do in order to better protect and secure our environment. Before I hand it over, 
to my co-presenter, Mike. I just wanted to give you my contact information and show you what the scary dude on the other side of the call looks like. And I have my new book, Advanced Persistent Threat, my 11th book that I wrote that came out about a year ago that covers a lot more of this in detail. And if we cannot get to all of your questions on this webcast, that's my contact information, ecole at secureanchor.com or eric at sans.org. And I also run the cyber defense curriculum at sans.org. So if there's anything additional that I can do to help you protect or secure your environment, just let us know, and we'd be happy to help you out. So with that, I'm going to go in and hand it over to a really good friend, a colleague of mine, Mike Yaffe, who's going to talk about how Beyond Trust can help implement these security solutions in a proactive manner. Mike, take it away. Thanks, Eric. And you know what you said to me yesterday? If uh, I, I, I don't understand the intro when you're not making fun of me a little bit, so I'm, I'm actually a little confused. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks. I appreciate your time. I'm just going to go on for a couple of minutes to let you know a little bit about Beyond Trust. Eric had some great words to say about us, so uh, I won't keep you too long. You know, there was a question uh, from Ben. He had asked, you know, are you able to, are uh, machines with lesser privilege or lesser vulnerabilities able to elevate and, you know, exploit machines? And just so you know, my background, I was at uh, Core Security uh, for 10 years, uh, you know, when it started. So, uh, you know, my background's in uh, exploitation, did some PKI, some middleware stuff, so uh, heavily into the exploitation. But if you can animate the first two slides, you know, typically is what you guys see is vulnerabilities can be used in one of two ways, right? They can be used to actually get through an application, a network device, and then leverage that into like a desktop or a user, or vice versa, right? You can uh, actually exploit a user, and then you can get into the application um, or into the infrastructure. It doesn't really matter which one you do, but the idea is that Users and assets are, and Eric talked about this ad nauseum, right, are completely intertwined throughout your environment. Where we live in the critical controls. Hey, Eric, if you want to flip to the critical control slide, that would be awesome. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic animation, you see it. And one more. But we're, you know, the reason we wanted to work together on this webcast is because what Beyond Trust does is it's user management and asset risk management. We have two lines of business. We have Retina, uh, you know, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. Sure, a ton of you at the DOD have used it before. Um, Beyond Trust purchased Retina about 18 months ago. I uh, made a ton of improvements. Uh, some of the things that we do there, the reporting is phenomenal, and um, you know we have great asset ID. On the user risk management side, we have something called Power Broker, and that allows you to manage privileges on your desktops, on your servers. We also have a password product, uh, competes with things like CyberArk. We also have an auditing product, so if you need to document an audit for either critical controls or for an upcoming audit, uh, we do that well. So where we live is, you know, we can help you guys meet, I'm not saying, you know, get the stupid obligatory checkbox, but, you know, we can help you satisfy uh, seven or eight of the specific critical controls that um, that Eric was talking about. And on the next slide, Eric, we can do it on one particular platform. You know, so the idea is that, you know, you guys have been buying stuff, right? Everybody tells you to buy a pen testing product, a bone scanner, a web app scanner, so, you know, a static code analysis, a dynamic code analysis. And you've got all this stuff, and it doesn't talk to each other. I know that's why you have SIM and GRC to some degree, but it doesn't help you manage the individual reports. So we can consolidate all this for you, and we do it pretty well. Um, on the power broker side, which is, again, the privilege, which is the user side, we can enforce audit and all the policies without obstructing, right? Group policy changes, right? So if you need to actually authorize a user to run an application, you don't have to elevate them to root on their own machine or system admin on their machine. And you don't have to give anybody root privileges on a server either. You can authorize the specific application to run without changing the uh, privilege level of the user. And then you can actually tie that back to the vulnerability stuff, right? So you can actually start looking at risk-based rules for users, which you know, Eric was talking about, we know IS and IT usually tell each other to go screw, right? You guys go out and find a vulnerability, hand it off to IT operations, and they don't do anything with it. What we have is kind of something that sits in the middle that allows you to say, look, 
if the user elevates is able to run these applications, we can actually document that the applications themselves have vulnerabilities. So it's really kind of lives in the middle where security and IT cross. So again, we have a whole user uh, privilege line of business. And on the next slide, uh, we talk a little bit about, again, Retina. So, uh, you know, Retina, it's, you know, it's Vuln Scanner, it's been around since 99. Uh, you know, the number of checks, you know, we have checks, everybody else has checks. Quite frankly, if anybody tells you the number of checks are differentiated, they're lying. Um, but what we also have is the reports are phenomenal. I will tell you, it's, it's, it's the thing that we do the best is we have terrific reporting. We help you either get out the information you need to make uh, decisions based on what you should work on first. Most of the folks that we deal with, you know, work on 3 to 5% of the discovered vulnerabilities. And I mean, put effort behind it. So we can help you figure that out a little bit. And our asset ID is terrific. The way you can manage all the assets, identify them, uh, give them rating, and then nest them within each other's and move them around. It's all drag and drop. It's pretty cool. Um, Eric, on the next slide. And one more thing about Retina. For those of you who don't know, it comes in a couple flavors. Retina, the desktop application that competes with Nessus, is 1200 bucks. all you can eat. Um, it is, uh, you know, that comes with reporting, that comes with unlimited scanning. So there is no catch, and people say that a lot. So we have, so if you're interested in that, we can, uh, you know, just let us know. Uh, so the Power Broker product, again, does privilege. It does Active Directory bridging um, with your Linux, uh, with your uh, with your servers into your Active Directory, uh, auditing protection. We have a web scanner, too. So um, in all this stuff, next slide, Eric, if you wouldn't mind, uh, runs on one platform. So if you plug it in and you want to use Retina, you just flip it on like a module. If you want to run Privilege on the desktop, same deal. So you know, if you have somebody on IS, IT, and it's, look, I know it's a pain in the ass to run uh, you know, 18 different products. So at least if you can consolidate and everybody can kind of agree on the metrics that are coming out, um, you know, hopefully it'll save you guys a, a, a bunch of time in the end. And the, the uh, platform's called Beyond Insight. And one more, Eric, I think we have one more or maybe two more animations, and then we'll uh, chuck it to the poll question. But, um, you know, it's got fantastic user management. And again, you see here, it's got the smart groups and the asset profiling, things that Eric talked about. And this comes with every product in the, in the platform. So if you want desktop stuff, you get all of this. If you want Retina, it comes with all of this. So uh, hopefully uh, we can have a, uh, you know, if anybody has a need out there. And if you guys wouldn't mind flipping to the poll question uh, quickly, that'd be awesome. And then we can. Um, yeah, for Mike. Yeah, 1200 bucks, unlimited scanning regardless of the total number of hosts. The answer is yes. No caveat. The answer is just yes. So guys, um, we have trials all over our website. So if you're up for speaking to somebody about a trial about any of this, just check the uh, tick the yes box and somebody give you a shout. Um, you know, I've been doing this. I've been working with SANS for 10 years. You know, we're not going to call and harass you if you don't want. You don't want a trial. Uh, don't worry about it, but if you think we can help you, uh, we'll hook you up. We'll set you up with a trial on any of the products. We're really easy to work with. Um, I've worked with Eric, unfortunately, for 10 years. So, you know, some a pain in the ass in other ways, but not only when it comes to, like, football and selecting where we eat for dinner. But other than that, let me know. Um, so, you know, we'll leave the poll question up for a few minutes. Uh, I have one uh, announcement. We're doing a couple more webcasts, uh, you know, with Kevin Johnson, uh, Shaq, we have Eric coming up again. Uh, we have a few more next week, so if you want to learn more about the platform, just uh, visit us at uh, beyondtrust.com. And uh, that's it. Our, so um, that's all I got. Eric, and we are literally one minute shy of the, uh, um, we are one minute shy. Sorry, I see questions firing in. So um, you want to take a few? Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll jump back in then, and we'll, uh, we'll just randomly pick a few of these. Uh, when implementing the asset configuration management process, you identify in steps one, two, and three. How do you suggest that folks manage obsolescence uh, 
asset life cycles as you address uh, the controls. Are you, the problem with uh, one-way communication is I can't ask for follow-up clarification. So uh, are, are you talking about outdated uh, assets or old assets? The way I always do with that is create an environment where you have segmented VLANs. So you might have your primary VLAN where you have your production environment firewall segmented off. And as you have outdated assets that might only be needed for limited business functions, you would slowly move them to less trusted network segments or less trusted VLANs and then use that as a way to still have them available if they're supported but you're now going in and minimizing and reducing the impact they would ultimately be able to have in that environment. Uh, hey, Eric, I saw a question, question yeah. for me, actually. Uh, somebody asked about whitelisting. We don't do whitelisting, like compete with uh, Bit9, per se. But what we do is, via group policy, you can give the application specific permission to run or not run on the machine. So and you can make that, uh, you know, you can make it for a set amount of time. You can say you can only run the app for two hours or you can make it um, permanent that the user can run that application depending on the business purpose. So as opposed to, we, it does the same thing, it just approaches the problem in a different way and it's a little bit easier, can, quite frankly, than actually having to go through and whitelist every application. Basically you can just with a couple clicks just authorize a, a specific one and you're off and running. And nothing, and the good thing is, nothing else that you don't uh, set to run will be allowed to run on any machine. Perfect. And at that point, we do want to respect your time, and it is two o'clock. And we do want to thank you, Mike, myself, and the folks at Sands. We do not take your time lightly. Lightly, and the fact that you would give us an hour of your time for us to talk with you and go through some solutions. Truly, from the bottom of our hearts, we do appreciate it. So thank you so much. If there's anything else we can do to help you, or if we didn't get to your question, it's still an important question, just shoot us an email. Mike, myself, and the folks at Beyond Trust, we talk all the time. So you can send me emails to them, vice versa, and we'll make sure it gets to the right person and we get you the answer that you want. So with that, thank you. Have a great Friday. Enjoy your weekend and have fun securing your systems and take care, and we hope to see you at an upcoming SANS event.